Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Exploring the Genetic Landscape of Solid Tumors Using Whole Genome Copy Number Analysis, presented by Dr. Ravindra Kolhe and Dr. Joanna Shibul. I'm Christy Jewell of Labrits, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Labrits and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. For more information on our sponsor, please click on the Thermo Fisher Scientific logo on the left of your screen. Now let's get started. I want to remind everyone that today's event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, Click on the support tab found on the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by using the ask a question box. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I would now like to introduce you to our speakers, Dr. Joanna Shabul, Senior Research Scientist at Stanford University. Also speaking, Dr. Ravindra Kolhe, Associate Professor of Pathology, Associate Director, Residency Program, and Medical Director, Cytogenics Laboratory, AUMC. For complete biographies on our speaker, please visit the Biography tab at the top of the screen. Dr. Shibul, you may now begin your presentation. Hello everyone, thank you for participating in this webinar. Today I will tell you about the use of SNP arrays for studying genomic profiles of tumors with complex DNA copy number alterations called leiomyosarcoma. Leiomyosarcoma is uh, one of the most common types of soft tissue sarcoma, tumors arising from different types of connective tissues. It's a malignant type of tumor with smooth muscle differentiation. The most common locations of leiomyosarcoma include retroperitoneum, extremities, and the uterus. Leiomyosarcomas are associated with poor clinical outcome, and current therapeutic options provide unsatisfactory results. Also, uh, the assessment of response to treatment in leiomyosarcoma patients is difficult, since the conventional imaging may not provide informative results. Because of that, new tools for an improved evaluation of response to treatment is highly needed for patients with leiomyosarcoma. Uh, leiomyosarcoma tumors are characterized by high genomic instability. Uh, on the picture on the left, you can see an example of a normal karyotype uh, of a male with two copies of each autosomal chromosome and uh, one copy of each sex chromosomes, X and Y. On the right-hand side, uh, you can see a, a karyotype of a representative case of leiomyosarcoma tumor uh, from, uh, from a female. And in this image, you can see additional copies of multiple chromosomes and losses of selected uh, chromosomes. The most frequent uh, DNA copy number losses in leiomyosarcoma affect multiple tumor suppressor genes like P53, RB1, P10, ATRX or CDKN2A. On the other hand, the most frequent copy number gains result in amplification of myoCD gene that encodes myocardin, a muscle-specific transcriptional coactivator. This graph summarizes the median number of somatic point mutations and copy number alterations across different types of cancers. And uh, based on this graph, you can see that uh, uterine leiomyosarcomas, as well as leiomyosarcomas arising in uh, different types of soft tissues, are characterized uh, by intermediate levels of both DNA copy number alterations and somatic point mutations. The most uh, important challenges in the treatment of patients with leiomyosarcoma are related to the lack of therapeutic targets in these tumors and also inadequate methods for evaluation of response to treatment. In this presentation, I would like to tell you about our liquid biopsy studies in leiomyosarcomas based on profiling molecular alterations in tumor-derived DNA in circulation. Liquid biopsy approach may be potentially useful, especially for uh, an improved and non-invasive assessment of response to treatment in patients with sarcoma. 
Potential applications of circulating tumor DNA include screening and early detection of cancer uh, and improved diagnosis uh, through genotyping of circulating tumor DNA. Uh, potential applications include also detection of minimal residual disease after the surgery, evaluation of response to adjuvant therapy, and detection of genetic alterations that may be associated with resistance to certain types of treatments. And finally, circulating tumor DNA uh, profiling may be also useful for a long-term follow-up uh, in cancer patients to, de to detect disease recurrence. Circulating tumor DNA is found in plasma or serum fraction of the blood. It's released by cells uh, dying through apoptosis or necrosis, or it can be also actively secreted in exosomes. Uh, it has been shown that DNA in circulation may harbor the same molecular alterations as DNA in the tumor. These alterations include point mutations, copy number alterations, chromosomal rearrangements, and DNA methylation. Um, the clinical utility of circulating tumor DNA monitoring has been shown in tumors that harbor highly recurrent mutations. As I uh, have uh, shown you, leiomyosarcoma represents a type of tumor with a wide spectrum, um, an intermediate spectrum of point mutations and copy number alterations. Therefore, we proposed a new strategy for profiling of circulating tumor DNA in leiomyosarcoma patients. And that approach combines detection of point mutations by deep targeted sequencing using a custom capture panel, together with detection of copy number alterations uh, through shallow whole genome sequencing. We assume that such combination approach may allow for an increased sensitivity of detection of circulating tumor DNA and may allow uh, to track a higher number of markers in plasma. For detection of DNA copy number alterations, we profile DNA extracted from tumor specimens using OncoScan FFPE assay, and we profile DNA from plasma by shallow whole genome sequencing. From each patient, we profiled up to seven different tumor specimens and several longitudinal plasma specimens. An essential step in this process is selection of appropriate uh, FFP tumor specimens. First, uh, we evaluate the percentage of tumor cells in the specimen based on HND staining. For this particular study, we selected mostly the samples with 90-95% of tumor cells. Next, we performed microdissection of the FFP tumor specimens by taking several 2 millimeter cores from the area with high content of tumor cells. After that, we extracted DNA from these 2 millimeter cores using all previous DNA RNA FFPE kit, including RNA treatment. Uh, DNA concentration and yield uh, was evaluated by qubits. Specifically, we used uh, the high sensitivity double stranded DNA assay. And later, we submit at least 80 nanograms of DNA extracted this way for OncoScan FFP assay to Thermo Fisher services. Um, the first step in the analysis of the OncoScan data includes evaluation of a variety of quality control uh, metrics. Selected important QC metrics include the median absolute pairwise difference, MAPD, which should be below 0.3 and also SNP quality control of normal diploid markers, which should be above 26. Diploid recentering may be performed manually if needed, which may be the case, especially in the tumors with high genomic instability. I will show an example of diploid recentering in the following slides. Um, in order to identify copy number alterations in our leiomyosarcoma study, we defined copy number gains and losses as the regions with log to ratio above 0.25 and below minus 0.25 respectively. We require the minimum of 200 probes per segment to focus only on uh, relatively large uh, alterations. And with this criteria, we identified a, medium, a median of uh, 80 alterations per tumor sample. The plate uh, recentering may be required in tumors with high genomic instability that may have low count of diploid regions. In such cases, normal diploid regions of log to ratio equals zero may not be recognized properly by the software, and it may be necessary to manually assign the diploid region of the sample, or in other words, to recenter the sample. Correct diploid regions may be identified based on the B allele frequency profile. 
In this example of uh, Lyomite sarcoma tumor specimen, you can see multiple, multiple false positive calls. For example, gains uh, of chromosomes 1, 3p, or 4p that are represented in the top panel with log 2 ratios. We call uh, these gains false positive because they have no corresponding allelic uh, imbalance, which can be seen in the bottom uh, panel called BAF, B allele frequency. Uh, to manually recenter the sample, uh, we may provide uh, an offset that tells the algorithm how much the profile should be pushed up or down so that the normal diploid regions uh, reside at log to ratio of zero. In this case, we indicate that chromosome one uh, is in the normal diploid state. We use the uh, median log to ratio of chromosome one, which uh, originally was 0.62, as the new log to ratio zero. And, um, in the bottom panel, you can see how the log to ratio of each chromosome has been corrected after diploid uh, centering using uh, uh, chromosome one as the new diploid uh, reference. In this slide, uh, you can see genomic profiles of the sample before and after this correction. The upper panel shows the original profile with positive calls with corresponding, without corresponding uh, allelic imbalances. And in the bottom panel, you can see the profile with correctly assigned normal diploid uh, regions. Based on uh, applying diploid recentering and the analysis criteria that I described in the previous slides, uh, we identified the following abnormality, uh, abnormalities in our sarcoma tumor specimens. The most frequent alterations included loss of RB1 tumor suppressor gene and amplification of myocardin gene, which is in agreement with the previously described uh, Lyomite sarcoma profiles in the literature. Interestingly, in the study, we profiled multiple tumor specimens from the same patient or multiple regions of the same tumor in order to study inter and intratumor uh, heterogeneity of copy number alterations in Lyomite sarcoma. In patient uh, LMS2, for example, you can see that we profiled two regions of primary uterine leiomyosarcoma, which is indicated as T1 and T3, and we also profiled a metastatic tumor uh, from brain. And based on uh, genomic profiles of the samples, you can see uh, heterogeneity within the primary tumor, which is indicated by uh, uh, selected copy number gains or losses that are being present only in certain uh, region of the primary tumor and not in the other, for example, in chromosomes one or two. In patient LMS5, we profiled the metastatic re retroperitoneal tumor and uh, multiple concurrent metastatic tumors from the abdomen that were removed approximately one year after the first tumor specimen. And in this example, uh, you can appreciate also the intertumor heterogeneity in sarcoma. for example, by looking at alterations in chromosomes 1, 3, or 18 across different tumor specimens. In patient LMS6, we profiled two different, uh, two different regions of a primary pelvic uh, lyomite sarcoma and two separate metastatic lung nodules. And from these profiles, you can see a big difference between genomic aberrations found in two separate metastatic uh, lung nodules that are um, indicated as T3 and T4. And in patient LMS7, uh, you can also see intertumor heterogeneity based on the analysis of the primary tumor from the calf and metastatic tumor from the thigh. Um, after characterizing genomic profiles of Lyomite sarcoma tumor specimens, we aim to identify tumor-derived alterations in cell-free uh, DNA in patient-matched uh, plasma specimens. Oncoscan FFP assay was used to define DNA copy number profiles of Lyomite sarcoma tumors because SNP arrays are currently the gold standard for detection and quantification of DNA copy number alterations. Uh, shallow whole genome sequencing was applied to detect DNA copy number alterations in plasma cell-free DNA, but this method may produce many false positive calls. Therefore, in order to identify only tumor-derived alterations in plasma DNA, we selected only the overlapping genomic regions, altered both in plasma and tumor DNA in each patient. Um, 
Shallow whole genome sequencing was performed on cell-free DNA extracted from 27 plasma specimens with the median coverage of 0.21x. Um, this allowed to identify tumor-derived alterations in 44% of the samples in five of seven patients included uh, in this study. Using this approach, we detected up to 194 tumor-derived DNA copy number alterations per plasma sample. Uh, copy number profiling in circulating tumor DNA was complemented by targeted deep sequencing by CAPSIC, cancer personalized profiling by deep sequencing. Using this method, we are able to track somatic point mutations in tumor suppressor genes, such as P53, RB1, and ATRX. We detected mutations in these genes in 68% of the analyzed samples uh, from six out of seven patients included in this study. In, um, this slide summarizes circulating tumor DNA profiles in selected patients with longitudinal plasma samples analyzed. The green line uh, indicates circulating tumor DNA detected by CAPSIC, so deep targeted sequencing. The dark blue line uh, represents circulating tumor DNA uh, levels detected by shallow whole genome sequencing, so the DNA copy number uh, alteration. And the light blue uh, panels in the background indicate the duration of chemotherapy. In patient LMS3, you can see that uh, initially high levels of circulating tumor DNA become undetectable after the initiation of chemotherapy and radiation therapy. However, circulating tumor DNA becomes detectable again with the progression of the disease. A similar scenario was observed in patient LMS5 where uh, circulating tumor DNA levels dropped after the surgery, radiation therapy, and ablation, but then uh, the levels increased uh, throughout the progression of disease. In patient LMS7, you can see that circulating tumor DNA became uh, undetectable for at least one year after complete resection of the tumor. In these profiles, you can see that the levels of circulating tumor DNA correspond with treatment in, in those patients. Um, finally, I would like to show how circulating tumor DNA may reflect intertumor heterogeneity. A major advantage of circulating tumor DNA compared to tissue biopsies is that circulating tumor DNA analysis simultaneously integrates contributions from multiple tumor deposits, enabling a more comprehensive analysis of tumor heterogeneity. In the left panel, you can see that uh, the 1Q gain was detected by SNP array only in a sim single tumor uh, that was removed during the second surgery. In the right panel, uh, you can see that the levels of DNA uh, with 1Q gain in circulation um, uh, were detected at two different time points um, among five longitudinal plasma samples. Uh, in uh, these profiles, we can see that the 1Q gain was detected already in the first plasma sample that was collected seven days before the first surgery. But this DNA alteration was not det detected in the tumor sample um, removed at that time because we analyzed only a single tumor, uh, a, a single region of that tumor. In summary, uh, our study of lyomite sarcoma shows that OncoScan FFP assays are useful for detection of DNA copy number alterations in archival tumor specimens. I showed an example of deployed, deployed recentering that allows for correction of genomic profiles in, tumor, in tumors with high complexity, such as lyomite sarcoma. Our results show that uh, copy number profiling using OncoScan FFP assays may reveal intra and intertumor heterogeneity. And in this particular study, genomic profiles characterized by SNP array in tumor specimens served as the reference for detection of circulating tumor DNA in plasma. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Kolhe. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, good morning, members of the call here. I'm a pathologist at the Medical College of Georgia, Augusta University. And today I'm going to talk about the uh, utility of SNP arrays and targeted uh, somatic mutations in evaluation of histologic mimic cystic myeloma. These are uh, relevant disclosures 
about the talk. Uh, I'm employed by Medical College of Georgia, and I do have support from Omar Shainsky. Uh, additional disclosures related to the talk, uh, but most importantly, uh, the opinions expressed in this presentation are my personal and does not represent the uh, opinions of Thermal Social Scientific and its affiliates or any of my collaborations and employers. Uh, the product Oncoscan FSP I'm going to talk about is intended for molecular biology application and not for diagnosis or prevention or treatment of disease. As I mentioned earlier, I'm a molecular pathologist and a practice candidate side of genetics along with that in the capacity as a medical director and the clear lab director. But uh, I also practice breast and surgical pathology and that plays a critical role in using these new technologies in uh, evaluation of surgical pathology cases. This is my outline. I'll go briefly over uh, the assay and SNP array as a whole, but I think uh, Joanna did a phenomenal job in introduction to the scan. I want to focus on why we ended up choosing melanoma as a poster child for its utility, and I'll add some other histologically challenging cases uh, of the scan FSP4. So before I begin, uh, we all need to acknowledge uh, the, the great service Kerotype has done for us in the past 30, to 30 plus years, but along with that, we also need to uh, recognize the limitations uh, care type has, especially with the low diagnostic yield, uh, the longer turn of time, uh, especially the, the low resolution, and it's really difficult these days to find these trained people who could uh, help us with care typing, and uh, as it is a subjective method, it, it's prone for human error. The other couple of challenges we, we see, especially in the surgical pathology field for uh, keratoping solid tumors is sometimes we get these blinded samples in the frozen room which yield basically a normal keratype. Uh, along with it, uh, there's overgrowth of non-neoplastic cells, again, giving an uh, inconsistent results. Uh, on top of that, if it's a necrotic tissue or uh, uh, and an abscess which leads to a culture failure or uh, microbial, microbial growth in, in keratite cultures. So uh, I want to add a couple of points to Joanna's introduction that the, the Oncoscan MIP probes which we use for the SNP arrays in the lab has a, has a pretty phenomenal coverage, uh, more focused on the oncology target. Uh, on the array, uh, talking about 240 case SNPs. Yeah, but the, the I think on the case, particularly, uh, especially if you're working in oncology, are the 74 SNP probes for the somatic mutation detection. And uh, these probes are directed against 74 mutations for nine critically important genes uh, in oncology, like BRAF, KRAF, EGFR, uh, which are uh, important in the uh, either diagnosis, prognosis, or therapy selection for majority of the cancer cases. So lastly, um, the, the, the need for microarray and cancer research is critical because as compared to other technologies we have been using, we don't need the dividing cells, uh, just the DNA from the target neoplastic cells. Uh, the, the assessment of the genome is at extremely high resolution. Uh, in SNP arrays. The interpretation is objective and is based on biostatistical algorithms, so there's a very less uh, human bias. Uh, one of the great advantage of using a SNP array is detection of copy neutral stretch systems like Alpha or LOH, what we call them. And you know, on the research side, it's a huge advantage because all the data is digital and you could uh, upload uh, to genome browsers and get annotated data, and another annotated database and get really nice uh, informative information uh, on an of one case. So coming back to the, the discussion topic of why we ended up choosing uh, melanoma as a poster child for the SNP evaluation. Uh, everyone knows that I mean, the melanoma is a critical problem, especially if you live in the South or in the Sun Belt. Uh, the H and E stain tissue still remains the main approach for evaluating melanocytic tumors. So, 
again, we are not trying to replace HNE with Simparase or any other molecular testing. Uh, the critical part is not the diagnosis of melanoma, but it it is suppression of these histologic mimics of melanoma, which are uh, a very problematic practical issue in dermatopathology. And, and the reason for that is uh, when melanoma escapes early detection, it is one of the most aggressive and highly lethal form of cancers. Although melanoma is a, a small uh, is a small part of the skin cancer, it is actually the, the major reason of skin cancer related death uh, in the United States. So when I when I say about histologic mimics of melanoma, I'm talking about histologic uh, entities in dermatopathology like atypical spinozoid nevus or spindle cell melanomas which mimic uh, AFX or FH type lesions, mevoid melanomas, proliferative nodules or large, especially in congenital nevi, uh, clear cell sarcomas, uh, regressed melanoma versus melanosis, melanoma transformation, especially in dysplastic or atypical nevus. So these are the kinds of lesions which are histologically very challenging in a small or limited biopsy. And then because of this limitation, uh, we are aware that either melanoma is uh, underdiagnosed or overdiagnosed, and this misdiagnosis of melanocytic lesion is at the top of the list of malpractice cases uh, in pathology, especially in the pathology. So let's, let's take a step back and look at these, uh, the progression of these melanocytic lesions uh, right from uh, a melanocyte or a dysplastic nevus. There are four main processes, proliferation, immortalization, invasion, and metastasis. And, and, and the good part is there are critical changes, both at the copy number as well as the SNVs, which are gained, added during this process, which are very specific for that particular moment. And people have been exploiting these changes to use in different types of assays to uh, answer these questions of melanoma versus histologic mimic. And one of the first tests introduced was the fish testing to evaluate these cases. We look at the first generation of the fish assays, which were used as a surrogate for these genomic instability. Again, this is the data coming out from 10 to 15 years of. Uh, uh, research on RACGH based on melanocytic lesion all across the world. Uh, one of the challenges, or yeah, one of the challenge of these first-generation fish assays was a very high cutoff for uh, these particular assays, which makes it very difficult to rule out melanoma, especially in critical cases. Then uh, the second generation of the fish came, where the new probes were added to expand the diagnostic utility. But uh, still, the cutoff for these lesions was uh, cutoff for these probes was very high. Then, and as I said earlier, the the challenge was the sensitivity and specificity, along with cutoff for these sets of probes. The added uh, disadvantage was polypoidy and trephopoidy, which was a common source of false positives, along with these fish in in these lesions. Uh, Apart from uh, the limitations in the fish, uh, we felt like melanoma had, had multiple other reasons, but these these two to look at. One was uh, the TCGA database uh, uh, gave out four new genomic subtypes of melanoma: the melanoma which are driven with BRAF, the one which are driven with RAS, NF1, and triple wild type. So I think at this day and age, we need to have general information along with the histologic diagnosis of melanoma to enable our oncologists to uh, identify cases in these different groups. Also, KP does have a pretty uh, in-depth melanoma biomarker uh, reporting template, which I think is critical uh, along with the diagnosis of melanoma. So uh, to summarize, uh, we, the reason we chose melanoma because uh, the ambiguous nature of this histologic mimics was very problematic. Uh, lim there were the existing limitations of the fish testing, uh, the cap biomarker template, which needed more information, and the TCG provided with the new molecular subtypes of melanoma. So to summarize, these are the different uh, genomic aberrations 
uh, in, in different melanocytic lesions, uh, which are captured across the uh, last 15 to 20 years of uh, uh, research. And the idea was whether we can put them together to help us uh, use a SNP-based technology and, and, and help uh, separate these histologic mimics. So, you know, initial evaluation uh, using OncoScan F50 assay, what we did was we picked up uh, 50 cases of melanoma, which were uh, worked out in a reference lab on fish testing. Out of which 36 were uh, histologically uh, mimics of melanoma, which were proven on fish, and 14 were fish proven melanoma. 95 of these cases were punch or shaved biopsies, uh, just small tissue, which is the realistic samples which we received from our derm clinic. Uh, all the samples in our study passed initial QT. Uh, all the samples were run on the OncoScan F50 assay, and the data was analyzed on the CHAS 3.0 uh, analysis software provided by the manufacturer. So, in reality, we were looking at these 50 sheets of melanoma because uh, I'm going to show you another slide which tells you that all these different examples of uh, uh, mel melanocytic lesions and, and their range of complexity associated with melanoma and how challenging they are in, in preventing us uh, from making a consensus diagnosis of melanoma. So these are the, some examples of the cases in our study, and each and every one uh, possesses a challenge in making a diagnosis of melanoma. For the lab workflow, uh, most if not all the cases, we get the block from our histology or dump pad. Uh, we look at the HNE slide, a macro dissection is performed depending on the tumor cellularity and the circumference, and then the DNA is extracted. So uh, we use around five micron sections uh, from a 50 block, two to three sections, depending on the size of the tissue, depaphanization, uh, DNA isolation, the data drop for a QC at check, and then adjusting the DNA volume uh, to get a 12 nanogram per microliter concentration for the assay. So again, to summarize the kinds of uh, samples or histologic diagnosis and their numbers which we used uh, in this evaluation assay was um, anything uh, which ranged from atypical dermal spindle cell melanocytic lesion to something as a compound segmented uh, atypical spinzoid tumor with congenital features and features of low mu. So these are literally uh, complex histologic mimics of melanoma, uh, which we use uh, in our evaluation assay. Uh, just to give an example of how a uh, whole genome view uh, would look on OncoScan F50 assay, this is just an example of a melanoma case which shows uh, the gain and loss in uh, the critical genes, which are usually abnormal in the uh, melanoma. And uh, as I earlier mentioned, the advantage of an OncoScan as a PSA is the, uh, is the probe against the 74 mutations, and one of them is the beta p 600 e which you can identify in the, in the keratogram of the melanoma. So the result of the uh, the evaluation study was pretty phenomenal. We were able to uh, uh, get uh, a near 100% analytical sensitivity and specificity. But for me, the most critical value was the negative predictive value. So in the assay, we are not trying to make the diagnosis of melanoma, but we are trying to make sure that we are not missing melanoma in these histologic mimics of uh, melanoma. So in addition to the, the melanocytic assessment of these cases, we use uh, uh, OncoScan F50 assay for assessment of low-grade adult brain tumors, atypical lipomatous tumors, atypical lipomatous tumors. I think uh, Joanna did a phenomenal job in explaining uh, the critical importance of SNP rays. Uh, more recently, we have started uh, to evaluate the bile duct brushing uh, FNA samples and see how we can use uh, OncoScan SFP in, in evaluating these uh, sample types. I'm just going to go over quickly a couple of uh, additional surgical pathology cases uh, which we 
are evaluating and uh, uh, helping our surgical pathologists. So uh, one of the great example, I think this is now a standard of care in majority of uh, the academic labs is uh, the, the low-grade adult brain tumors. Uh, the, one of the biggest uh, advantage of using uh, an assay like uh, Oncoscan FFP is, is a combination of both uh, CNVs as well as uh, mutations. Um, the NEGM article, again based on the TCGA database, basically identified the limitation of histologic diagnosis, saying that the low grade uh, gliomas, if you have an IDH wild type of 1P19Q4 deletion, have a whole different clinical presentation and outcome, irrespective of the grade type. And that has led us to identify these newer generation of testing modality to help our neuropathologists and neuro-oncologists. So I'm just summarizing the NEGM article, which basically uh, basically identified this, this limitation in our surgical pathology uh, diagnosis. So for just to give an example how we uh, evaluated the uh, Oncoscan FFP assays for low-grade adult brain tumors, we go through a barrage of uh, uh, SNP uh, areas, something in, as IDH1 and 2, be it after 600D, EGFR, PDGFR, meta-amplification, 1P19Q deletion, and so on, which has helped us uh, tremendously to do a proper evaluation of our low-grade uh, adult brain tumors. And this is just uh, uh, evidence-based publicly available uh, Algorithm which talks about uh, subclassifying the molecular subclassification of, of adult brain tumors uh, on SNP arrays, uh, especially in Oncoscan FFP. This is again a, a whole genome view of adult brain tumors, which uh, looks at different genes which are uh, dysregulated uh, on an adult brain case tumor, which, which again is, is a is very critical in analysis for uh, based on the new WHO classification of uh, adult brain tumors. Uh, this is again a whole uh, karyogram view which adds the IDH1, uh, 1P19Q uh, an analysis to the surgical pathology evaluation of uh, the, this oligo oligodendroglioma case. In addition to melanoma and uh, adult brain tumors, we also look at atypical lipomatous tumors, especially differentiating between something uh, as simple as lipoma versus liposarcoma uh, on a limited core biopsies. Uh, we have, again, looked at a barrage of uh, abnormalities which are critical in making that differentiation. Uh, and this is just an example which we presented at the uh, EAP meeting last year, which looks at these small core biopsies, which are very histologically challenging, uh, especially in a big retroperitoneal region, but the whole genome SNP array uh, definitely makes a substantial addition to the histologic uh, evaluation of these small biopsies, especially differentiating between lipoma or liposarcoma. Something uh, very trivial on the cytology like specimens where you're trying to differentiate between reactive mesotheliums versus mesothelioma. We had a loss of the BAP1, uh, which can be detected on immunostochemistry, but also on uh, an LOH of BAP, uh, BAP1, uh, especially on 3P211. Uh, it makes a huge uh, addition to the uh, cytologic evaluation of these, again, uh, uh, cytologically challenging cases like meso versus reactive meso. So these are the, uh, the additional cases or additional surgical pathology scenarios where uh, an assay like Oncoscan FFP or SNP array can make a substantial addition uh, to the histology or cytologic uh, evaluation for, for the surgical pathologists or cytopathologists. We 
we use them for atypical lipomatous tumors, renal cell carcinoma, especially for histologic classification, especially when we get these small core biopsies for post cryo surgery. Uh, we uh, have ongoing research project to understand the CNV in Barrett's esophagus, especially in, again, in cytology or smaller specimen. Uh, GYN oncology with uh, synchronous primaries of met metastatic lesions. Um, as I earlier mentioned, uh, we're also looking at evaluating the ability in delivery and pancreatic tract uh, rushings. So this is a lab. Uh, uh, Dr. Chauve, Dr. Mondal, and Dr. Dupont are, are, are the different people in the lab which make all these things possible. And uh, these are some of the research associates in the lab the lab techs uh, working on uh, this particular project. Thank you. Uh, Christy? Thank you, Dr. Colhe and Dr. Chabot for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of our webinar. If you have a question that you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Okay, let's get started. Our first question. Now, Dr. Shabul, Dr. Kohei, I believe this could be for either of you. How many SNPs are covered by the OncoScan SFPE assay? Uh, I can take this question, actually. So, um, the OncoScan SFPE assay captures alleles of over 220,000 SNPs across human genome. And um, in addition, there are around uh, 900 cancer genes uh, that are covered with increased density of probes for better resolution. Thank you. Now, Dr. Colhe, I believe this one's for you. What is the DNA quality and quantity required by the OncoScan assay? Uh, in our evaluation studies and, uh, and currently in the lab, we try to get as much as possible, but our minimum cutoff is 80 nanograms of total DNA uh, with the 12 nanogram per microliter as input uh, volume. And uh, it is measured by qubit, both double-stranded, and that, that something as that simple has been pretty successful uh, in our assay. Thank you, Dr. Kohei. Dr. Shabul, let's come over to you on this one. How were the DNA copy alterations identified in plasma cell-free DNA? Um, we applied the protocol that was initially developed for non-invasive prenatal testing uh, by our colleagues from K11 in Belgium. And in brief, we performed single-end uh, sequencing on the Illumina machine, and we, requ we required at least uh, 10 million reads per sample to be uh, appropriately uh, mapped. And um, we identified copy number alterations in plasma cell free DNA using modified plasma seq algorithm. And uh, what is important for this analysis, we used almost 400 uh, profiles of healthy donors to define what is the baseline, what are the baseline profiles in uh, healthy individuals. And uh, based on uh, this uh, uh, baseline, we defined genome-wide uh, segmented disease scores in samples from leiomyosarcoma patients in relation to those normal profiles. So uh, that, that's how the copy number alterations were called, based on the disease scores uh, uh, calculated from plasma cell-free DNA. Thank you, and let's go ahead and have you answer this one as well. What type of specimens do you typically use? Um, the samples that we typically use for, specifically for OncoScan SSPE assay are, um, are sarcoma samples, because this is what uh, our laboratory is focused on. Um, so during my presentation, I uh, explain exactly what is the process, how we, how we select the samples. We pay a lot of attention to high uh, content of tumor cells that is first evaluated by a uh, pathologist. And then uh, I think that also the step of macro dissection of the sample is very important to 
um, avoid contamination from normal cells. Thank you. And Dr. Cole, hey, I'd like to ask you the same question. What type of specimens do you typically use? So, Christy, in, in our uh, evaluation study as well as currently in the lab, we use uh, multiple different specimen types, uh, mostly uh, FFP. Uh, in the FFP, we use uh, samples coming from punch biopsy, resection specimens, uh, excisional biopsy. And as Joanna said, uh, uh, most if not all of these samples get h &E examination by a pathologist to assess the tumor cellularity and uh, tumor enrichment, and then we do the macro dissection for DNA isolation. The, the, the samples are coming from a variety of uh, tumor types like melanoma, adult brain tumors, uh, lyomimas, uh, lyomisarcomas, uh, anything, any, any specific histologic subtype where we have a challenging case, we tend to get these samples. Uh, more recently, we have also uh, tried to evaluate the assay on cytology specimens, so these will be a fresh FNA samples, and uh, at the end of the day, what matters is a, a good quality and quantity of DNA. Uh, if we can achieve that, I think the assay uh, performs uh, well. Thank you, and it looks like we have time for one more question. And Dr. Cole, hey, let's end on this final question. What genomic region was analyzed in the targeted deep sequencing of plasma DNA? I think I'm going to let Dr. Joanna answer that because uh, I think uh, her lab has done the work on the plasma DNA. Joanna, you want to take this? Yes, yes, of course. So uh, for for this study, we used um, we designed a, a custom capture panel that covers uh, more than one eighty kb, and this was specific panel designed based on the analysis of seventy seven uh, lyomysarcoma tumor specimens that were analyzed by TCGA consortium. We used uh, exome sequencing uh, data from these specimens paired with uh, normal DNA from those patients, and that way uh, we identified uh, more than 300 exons that were the most frequently mutated in those patients, and that's how we uh, uh, came up with our uh, custom panel for deep targeted sequencing of the most frequently mutated regions in lyomysarcoma, and that's what we used to profile cell free DNA from plasma. Thank you again, Dr. Colhan, and Dr. Shabul. Do you have any final comments for our audience? I, I would like to just summarize by pointing out that uh, Oncoscan FFP assay um, is very useful for detection of copy number alterations in archival tumor specimens. And uh, specifically, it's also useful for characterizing uh, tumor heterogeneity um, in, in tumors uh, with uh, high genomic complexity. And then to follow up on uh, Joanna's comments, I think, Christy, uh, what Oncoscan FFP assay has done in surgical pathology is, is helping our surgical pathologists to uh, you do a pretty decent molecular analysis on histologically challenging cases uh, like the one I mentioned in my talk. But on top of that, it is also helping us to provide a better uh, diagnosis and prognosis of cases like adult brain tumors uh, to match up with uh, the new classifications, uh, which are focused on, which are focused based on molecular subtypes. Now, before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speakers via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. I'd like to once again thank Dr. Ravinder Kolhe and Dr. Joanna Shabul for their time today and for their important research. We'd also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand, and Labrits will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event.
Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Until next time, goodbye.